Colossians chapter 2, we're looking at verses 6 and 7, just a couple verses. Uh, if you have been walking with us, uh, we're, we're, let's just look at these together. Beginning with verse 6, it says, Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Now, to my church family, you know, right, when you come, when you come to that word therefore, you have to ask, what is it? Right? You, you've learned that over the years. So you know. We've got to ask that question this morning. What's the therefore? Therefore. Right? Now, therefore is always looking back. Right? So when you come to that, you're going to begin to reflect on what you have already seen. And so this is a huge, this is a huge therefore. It's, it's, it's the hinge on which the entire letter kind of moves around. So everything prior to this little, this little preposition is leading up to this point. And everything after it flows out of this point. And so it's big, right? This is, this is really the, vi- the, the dividing point of Paul's letter. So as we think back to what we've already seen, right, when Paul says, therefore, he's saying because or, you know, so what? Right? That's, that's, the, that's the question we want to answer, right? We've been walking through, looking at these great and, and, and glorious truths, but then we stop and we say, what? So what? What does that mean to me right now where I'm at? And that's what this therefore does for us. Right? It brings us to a point where we apply this. This is where the rubber meets the road for us as the people of God. So we're looking back, therefore, on what? <laughs> this supreme, sovereign, sufficient Savior that we saw in chapter 1. Right? The, that we, we see in, in verse 14, the, the one in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. In verse 15, who is the image of the invisible God. And then in, in verse 16 and 17, the creator and sustainer of all things. And in verse 18, he is the head of his body, the church. So we're zeroing in, focusing in on Christ, on who he is. And so Paul says, in light of who he is. That he is the supreme and sufficient one. That it all stops with him. Therefore, in light of that, then do this. And and, and that's what we're talking about this morning. Now, this is important for the Colossian church. Remember, Paul's never met them. He just heard about some concerns that Epaphras, their, their founding pastor, has for them. The one who brought them the gospel. He's heard that there's some false teaching that's coming in. And, and they're, they're not necessarily saying that there's anything wrong with Jesus himself. They're just saying that he's not enough, right? You, you need to add some things in to, to come to full spiritual knowledge and understanding. And so Paul's writing into that and saying what? No, you don't. You don't need anything else. <laughs> Jesus is enough. He's enough. And we've been shouting that week after week. And it should begin to sink in that no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're experiencing, no matter where you're at on your journey, Jesus is enough. He's enough. He's he's sufficient for your every need, and he is supreme over every situation. So that's vital for us as we're moving into this section. We're just going, therefore, therefore what? Therefore, and here, here, this marks the beginning from our vantage point of this Christian journey. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord. So as you received this supreme, sovereign, sufficient Savior, this is what you do. Now, we want to stop just for a moment because this focuses on that beginning point. Right? And we, you know, Paul's saying, to this group of people, you have, you have received this, right? this. This journey for you has begun. Right? And, and it began the moment that you received Christ Jesus the Lord. Right? To receive means to, to lay hold of, to, 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 to grab a hold of something that's been delivered. And, and it's, 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 a, it's an image that you can picture in your mind, right? So when, when a package comes to your door that's been delivered, right, they can bring it to your door, but until you actually grab a hold of it and take it for yourself, it has not been received. Right? This happens all the time at our house, right? <laughs> the, I have, if you were for UPS, I'm sorry, they, they drop packages all over the place. They delivered them, <laughs> and sometimes we have to have a little Easter egg hunt to find where they put them. Right. And, and, and so, delivered, but until I have what? Until I've got it in my hand and it, I haven't received it. 
And, and so here we see a picture where something has been delivered to these Colossians. And they have, they've grabbed a hold of it. They've received it for themselves. We see a, a very similar picture when Paul's writing to the church at Corinth. Right? When he says, I delivered to you the gospel. The gospel is the good news, right? The good, this message, life-giving message. And, and the message is what? He says, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. This is what I received for myself. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Now here Paul's delivering a, a set of precepts, principles, truths. Right? And he's saying, I was, these truths were delivered to me and I received this for myself and now I'm delivering it to you. The truth is what? It's the gospel. It's the good news that Jesus died for our sins, that he was buried and he rose again. But here in Colossians, it's not talking about a set of precepts. It's talking about a person. As you received Christ Jesus the Lord. You have to do something with that. This is, this is an, an aorist active, which means, I, I, don't, I don't always like to talk about you know, the Greek tenses, but this passage in particular, we need to focus in a little bit on what those are. And so this means simply that it took place at a particular point in time. There was a definite point in their life where they grabbed a hold of this person of Christ for themselves. Right? And so uh, it, it's, it's, it's in the active tense, which means they did it. It wasn't something that was done to them. Jesus Christ was presented to them. They saw Christ, and when they saw Christ, they said, I want that. I want that. It was, it was a point in time in their life where they said, if I, have, if I do not have Jesus, then I have nothing. If I do not have Jesus, then I, I perish. Right? That's the, the, the picture that we have here as they begin the Christian journey. And so there's two things we want to focus on when we think about the idea of receiving Christ Jesus the Lord. Number one is, how do I receive this? How does this journey begin? Uh, to, to simply ask the question. And, and, and you know, to lay hold of Christ, to receive him, is more than simply, it's more than an intellectual thing. Right? In fact, as I look around this morning, probably most of you have been in church, most of you, your whole life. Right? Some of you, maybe not so much, and maybe some of these truths are not familiar to you, but for many of you, You've grown up hearing this gospel message over and over. And so when I say that Jesus died for you, that he was buried and he rose again, you're going, I know that. I, I've, I've known that since I was three years old, right? I've, I've heard that. Right? So there's an intellectual capacity for you to know. Now, to know that truth is not the same as receiving that truth. In fact, you can believe that truth. You can believe that it is true. You can, you know, it's one thing to hear facts and say, well, I'm not sure if I'm with that or I'm not with that. But you can even believe, right? You can say, you know, I know that is true. I believe it to be true. But yet it's still not the same as receiving it for yourself. This, let me give you a picture here. Just You're sitting in front of, of the lunch table and there's a big juicy steak in front of you. For most of you, that, that works. Some of you, just picture something else you like if it doesn't work. You're sitting there in, in front, and, and, there, and there it is, and you can smell it, and you can see it, and you think, oh, man, that looks good. That looks so good. And you go, there it is. I know that's true. I know it's filling, right? I, I, I believe that if I ate that steak, that it would just, man, it would taste so good, and it would give me, and it would satisfy my need, and it, I'd be full for the rest of the day. And so you know that, you believe that, but you push the chair in, you get up, and you walk away from the table. Now, just because you saw that and you believe that, is that going to fill you? Is that going to satisfy you? Of course not. You actually have to what? You've got to dig in. You have to take that steak in and eat it and consume it. And when you do, you experience the fullness of receiving that. Well, that's the same, the same idea when it says that Jesus Christ is received. It means not just that you know it, not just that you believe it, but that you Actually, Peter says, taste and see that the Lord is good. <laughs> you take him for yourself. Charles Spurgeon said it this way. The thing which I receive becomes my own. I may believe it to be real, but that is not receiving it. Receiving is the bona fide taking into my hands and appropriating to myself as my own property that which is given to me. 
Now this is what the soul does when it believes on Christ. Christ becomes my Christ. His blood cleanses my sin. You see the difference? It's one thing to, to, to hear a truth, to accept the truth, to, to even believe a truth. But then to receive it to yourself is to say, that's my, that's my Jesus. And that's my forgiveness that I have in Christ. And you take him to yourself. And so, you know, that's the, the first question is, how do I receive? And we do it by, by taking Christ for our own. But then the second question that Paul brings up here is, what do I receive? And it's significant. It's certainly significant in our, in our culture of easy believes, believism and cheap grace that simply says, if, if you just pray this prayer, then you get to go to heaven. Now, I know that's kind of a short gospel presentation, but it's not that much different for what many people are presenting to you today. <laughs> right? They'll say a little bit about how Jesus came, and he, he came to give you a good life, and he came to save you, and, and if you just pray this prayer and believe in him, then you can go to heaven. Well, that is a cheap gospel. Because within that gospel, there's no mention of what? There's no mention of sin. There's no mention of judgment. See, the good news that Jesus came and died for you means very little unless you understand you needed him to come and die for you. We desperately need Jesus to come and die for us because we have sinned. Because we have sinned, we need a Savior. And so Paul here lays out, you know, not just how I receive, but what I receive. And what we receive here is, is Christ Jesus the Lord. Christ is who? It's the Messiah. It's the anointed, the promised prophet, priest, and king. This is the one God has promised from eternity past who would come and rescue and redeem. And so when we appropriate, when we receive Christ, we're taking him as a sure and certain promise of God's faithfulness. We're saying, God, this is the one that you have promised. This is the one you have given. And then Jesus is his what? It's his earthly human name that was given by his father, Joseph. But remember when, when, when uh, the angel appeared to Joseph in Matthew 1? What did he say? You shall call his name Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sin. Right, so... Even as we think about his coming, his incarnation, why did he come? He came to save. He came to save sinners. So when he says to receive Christ Jesus, he's saying, you receive him as a savior. You recognize your sinful condition and you, you fall on him, understanding that without him, you don't have a leg to stand on. Now that's the, that's the way the scripture portrays us apart from Christ. Apart from Christ, we are depraved, we are fallen. We have no merit of our own before God. Now, that, that's not fun, right? That's not fun to think about because in general, most people, and maybe this is where you're sitting this morning, most people think they're a pretty good person. I, I, I've played this game a lot. <laughs> Just talking with people out. You know, would you say you're a good person? 90, 95% of the time, somebody's going to say, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a good person. We typically think the best of ourselves. And the scripture says the opposite. That there's none righteous, no, not one. In fact, Isaiah says what? Even our goodness, our good works is filthy rags before a holy God. The very best that you have to offer to God is not enough to save you. And until you come to that realization, you cannot receive Christ. To receive Christ, is, 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 is we see that imagery in in Luke 18, the publican and, and, and the tax, or the, yeah, the, the Pharisee and the tax collector coming to the temple. The Pharisee comes and says, oh God, I'm thankful I'm not like everybody else. You know, I'm, I'm a good guy. I'm a good person. And, and the, the tax collector, who knows he's sinners, he just falls on his knees before God and says what? God, have mercy on me, a sinner. <laughs> and Jesus says, only one of those men left the temple justified. Only one of them left with their sin forgiven. And who was it? Not the man who said, I'm a good guy. I'm, I'm so thankful I'm not like everybody else. It was the one who recognized his sin and called out to God for mercy. That's what it means to receive Jesus as your Savior. You fall before him. You cry out to him. And, and then we receive him as he is, Christ Jesus, the Lord. He is the exalted creator. Right? He is the, the first and the last. He is supreme over all 
things. See, to receive Jesus Christ is not merely to grab a hold of a, a, a get-out-of-hell free card, <laughs> which is what many people think. It's to surrender and submit your life to the supreme Lord of the universe. <laughs> Philippians chapter 2, Paul says, There is coming a day when every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But for those who know him, for those who have received him, they've already bowed that knee. They've already surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it means to begin this journey. Now, you may not understand all of that, but for as much as you do understand, you grab a hold of, of, of Christ. You receive him as he is. And this is the most important question for you this morning. Have you received Jesus Christ the Lord? Now, I know, I know most, of you, most of you out there are going to say, yeah, I've done it. But, but perhaps this morning you're hearing this message and going, I've received something, but it wasn't Jesus. <laughs> I received something, but it wasn't, I, I didn't, not, not, not a Lord, right? A Lord has the idea that I'm surrendering, I'm submitting, I'm following his lordship. So when Jesus says, do this, you say, that's what I want to do. And if I don't do that, then I'm, I, feel, I feel convicted of that. And I say, Lord, I'm sorry, I didn't do that. Forgive me, right? We're, we're surrendering our life to the Lord Jesus Christ. So to come to Jesus as Lord means that I'm following him in obedience to the best that I can. That's my heart's desire. Now, we don't do that perfectly, I know. But maybe you're here and you're going, you know, I've, I've never received that. <laughs> I've never received that. And, and today, that's your greatest need. Your greatest need for your life for, is to begin this journey by receiving Jesus Christ, the Lord. And many of you have done that. I know that, right? And so here's what happens, right? Paul's writing to those who have received. And as he's writing to them, he says, the way in which you receive Jesus Christ is, is the way in which you are now to live. Did you, did you catch it? Therefore, as do you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Now, the idea of a walk means a lifestyle. Right? It, it's, it's characterized by the way you live. And so here Paul's saying, the way that you're going to live your, your life now, the way that you're going to go on this journey as the people of God is the same way in which you received Christ. How did you receive Christ? Well, there was great humility, right? There was an understanding that you, you couldn't do it, that you didn't have it within you. And, and so you, there, there was great fear. <laughs> and, and, uh, there was a casting yourself upon him, knowing that he is your only hope. And so it's in that very same spirit of dependence that we live each and every day this Christian life. The way in which you began as you cried out to him to rescue you, as you called on him to save you, recognizing that you had nothing of yourself, he says that way is the way in which you're to live your life day in and day out. This begins to describe the middle, right? We see the beginning. The, it begins when you receive Jesus Christ, but now we are called to walk in him. In him. It, it speaks of First uh, John 2, 6. We are now to walk as he walked. This is what this Christian journey looks like. Right? We, we began and now we set out. We set out towards the end. We're setting out towards that celestial city, towards Zion, towards glory, right? towards Christ's likeness. But along that walk, there are many things to distract and deter. And so if we're going to walk faithfully, and we're going to walk the way that God calls us to walk, then we want to we walk as we started, in humility, in fear, in dependence on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, walking implies some things, right? Walking implies, first of all, action. <laughs> Too many people make a profession of salvation and then nothing happens. You say, yeah, I want to go to heaven. I'll take that. And then you just go about your life like nothing ever happened. Nothing changes. That's not salvation. That's you just taking what you want. Walking implies action. Right? We're carrying out the practical effect of what we believe. We believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, and so that's going to play out in my life now, in, in, in action, in deed. It'll be evident. So 
It implies that we are going to be changed and the direction of our life is going to change. Prior to Christ, we were heading a direction. We were serving who? We are serving me, right? myself. Right? I, I'm looking out for number one. But now, in Christ, I'm serving him. I'm walking in a new direction. Right? And, and, and so it, it also signifies progress. Right? We're running forward. We're running in a direction or what walking, right? This is... And, and this is the journey that we're on. We're, we're walking ultimately towards Christ's likeness. And so we're moving in that direction. And it's a process. Right? As you're walking along a journey, right, you don't get there immediately. It takes time. Right? So it implies continuance. Right? This is a perpetual walk. In fact, it's in the active tense. It's a command that is given to every single believer. And it's a command... right? It, it means walk and keep on walking. Don't quit. Don't stop. Don't give up. Right? Some of you, perhaps, on this journey have felt like, I'm, I'm tired. I'm done. It's enough. What does he say? Walk. Keep on walking. Don't quit. Don't stop. We are to walk in him. Now, <laughs> that is a mind-shattering type of thought here to walk in him is, is like it's to say like to walk in the air <laughs> i mean it, it, it's the it's the sphere in which we walk the way in which we walk around within the the you know the atmosphere that we live is the way in which we're to walk in christ he's to be the the air that i breathe the atmosphere that i live in the all-consuming thought and strength and delight of my heart to walk in him means what? He's going to be the first thing I think about when I wake up. He's going to be the last thing I think about when I lay my head on my pillow at night. To walk in him means that we're going to be looking to him throughout our day. As you go to work and as you go to school and as you're, as you're raising your little ones and you're taking care of them and, and as you're, 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 uh, you're carrying out your duties uh, on your, uh, your job, whatever it is that you're, fills your day, it's done in Him. In Him. It's, it's a perpetual, continual type of walk. And then what, what Paul's going to do here is he's just going to give us some participles to kind of, what does this walk look like? And he, and he shares some metaphors that help us understand, um, several actually, that are going to help us kind of understand how do we do this? You know, how do we walk along this journey? And the first one is an agricultural metaphor, right? So he says... Walk in him, verse 7, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith. Right, so the first part of the symbol is, is rooted, agricultural. It means to be firmly fixed, thoroughly grounded. Right. Now, we're walking out of this truth. Right. This is a reality that is going to help us on, it's going to help us remain faithful on this journey. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we are rooted in him. It's a, it's a perfect passive. Right? So passive means what? It's something that is done to us, not something that you do. So as you're walking on this journey, you're not trying to root yourself deeper. You have been rooted in Christ. Right? So what's the picture here? The, the New American Standard is, is a great, it just says, having been firmly rooted. What does that mean for you and I? If, if this is an action that has been done to us, completed in the past, the moment you received Jesus Christ, you were rooted in him. Oh man, that takes our memory verse to new levels. Now, we've been looking at Romans 8, 30, 38 and 39. It says what? I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor what? Nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. If you have been rooted in Christ, nothing, nothing can rip you apart from that. It's, it's the same picture that you know, nothing can take me out of the Father's hand. We travel on this journey with this firmly fixed in our minds. We're flowing out of this truth. 
I am in Christ. And nothing can separate me from his love. It's good to be reminded of, isn't it? If you have a set confidence, assurance that you are in Christ, then you can walk with a certainty. You ever, you ever experience doubt? You ever, you ever wrestle with assurance of your salvation? You ever question? If you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, then you have been rooted in him. You, your, your salvation is sure. Now, I don't want to give anybody a false hope this morning. Right? If, you're, if you're walking and living in sin and, and you have no thought of Christ, you've just made a profession of faith, then, then be warned, all right? Be, 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 be aware that that may be a false profession. I, I don't want to give anyone false hope, but if you've received Christ, yes, we struggle, yes, we fall, yes, we fail, but there's nothing that can rip us away from him. And so then we live in light of that truth. John 15, 5 says, Jesus said, you are the, you, I am the vine, you are the branches. Abide in me and I in you, because without me, you can do nothing. Right? There's that agricultural, right? We have been rooted in the vine. That is the source of life, the source of strength, the source of power. And as long as we're in him, we have sufficient power to live the life that he's called us to live. In fact, without him, we can't. We can't. <laughs> we, 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 that vine imagery is so helpful, right? Because any separation at all, it doesn't matter how great. When a vine is separated from the root, you know, what happens? It begins to die immediately. It doesn't matter if it's this far or this far or that far. It doesn't matter. The moment it's separated from the vine, it's, it's dying. And so we walk in him, rooted in him. Right? And then he moves to an architectural metaphor. So we're rooted and built up in him. And, and, and so the, the imagery here is building upon something that is already built. So we're talking about a foundation here that is, that is set, that is grounded, that is thoroughly fixed. You know, Paul wrote to the, the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 3, he said, according to the grace of God given to me like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. It says not only have we been rooted in the past, it's, a, it's an action that is done, but now we are being built up in him. Right? Different tense, present tense, actively taking place. So currently on this Christian journey, God is working in you, building you up in Christ. Now that's, that gives us hope, does it not? This is the sanctification process that's ongoing in the life of a believer. Yes, we struggle. Yes, we fall. But God is, for, to just keep the, the, the architectural metaphor, he's still working on me. You remember that, that little song? He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. Right, that's, that's the picture that we have here. He's building on the foundation, which is Christ, but it's a continual process that does not stop until Christ's likeness is achieved. And it, again, this is a passive, it's a passive participle, which means that it's not a work that we do. It's the work that he is doing. The, the verse that portrays that most clearly is Philippians 1.6. He who begun a good work in you will complete it, will perform it. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we walk on this journey knowing that the end is, is achievable, that God is going to accomplish that for which he saved us. So we're rooted in him, being built up in him on the rock that is, that is Christ Jesus. The end of Matthew chapter 7 paints that picture so, so perfectly. As Jesus is teaching, right, he gives those two examples. Right? The one building his house on the rock, the other man building his house upon the sand. 
What are you building your life on? Jesus Christ is the rock. And he says, those who build your house on the rock, the winds may blow, the storms may howl, but your house will stand. But those who built their house on the sand, the winds come, the storms, and what? The house falls, and great is that fall. To build your, to build your life on anything but Christ means sure, certain doom and destruction. It will not stand. It will not stand. Agriculture, architectural, and then lastly, or, well, thirdly, educational. So we have been rooted and built up in him and established in the faith just as you were taught. So we're being established by truth. Now that truth is something that was taught. So here, Paul's saying, you know, Epaphras brought you this word. He taught it to you. And that truth, you're being firmly established in. Again, this is present tense, actively happening, but it's passive. So God is firmly entrenching us in this truth. It's a continual process. What does that mean for us? The, the temptation, certainly for the Colossians, is They've come to Christ, and now they want to move to deeper things. They want to move to more important things, better things. And Paul's saying, we don't move away from Christ. We simply grow deeper in him. This is important. It's significant, right? Sometimes we, we preach this gospel, and we talk about you know, living for Christ. And, 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 and Can we move on to some actual practical things? I, I, I want to move on to some... You know, maybe deeper truths. There's no deeper truth. Christ is inexhaustible. You can't come to the end of him. You can't plumb the depths of who he is. And so Paul says we're being established in him. This truth, this Christ that has been delivered over to you, we grow in him. That means that as we grow in him, it affects every single area of our life. Who I am as, as, a, as, a, as a husband or a wife flows out of who Christ is. Who I am as a mom or a dad flows out of who Christ is. Who I am as an employee or, or as, a, as a business owner. Who I am as a student. Who I am as a teammate, as a neighbor. Over and over. Who I am flows out of who Christ is. And that truth continually is transforming me. You can see how this affects the relationships that we have. We go back to the first one alone. The relationship of a husband and a wife. If, I am, if I'm relating to my husband or my wife right, in a way that is Christ-like and I'm growing in that, then that's going to affect the way I talk to my wife. It's going to affect the way I serve my wife. Because what? We see, we see how Christ loved and we're going to begin to mirror and grow deeper in that love. <laughs> We're, you, I mean, let's, let's be honest, right? We, we hurt each other. Right? We, we fail each other. We let each other down. But what? We forgive one another as Christ Jesus has forgiven us. And, and every relationship, every sphere of life that we're in is affected by, by Christ. By who He is. By what He's done for us. And so we as his people, are seeking to know him more, more deeply, more fully. <laughs> Charles Simeon said, I, I, want, I want my heart, Lord, increase the capacity of my heart for Christ. <laughs> Understanding that his heart cannot, cannot fully, <laughs> you know, has no capacity to take in the fullness of Christ. He says, no, Lord, let, let my heart grow to, to, to the heavens that, that Christ may fill it. Understanding that the heavens themselves cannot, cannot fully take in Christ. He says, let, let, let my heart grow to seven times the heavens. That I may receive Christ, all of him, in all his fullness. May I grow to know him more and more. We, we sing that song, right? Knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, there is no greater thing. Now that's beautiful. But we need to know him more, more, more deeply, more fully. And then lastly, he says, and here, 
we move to present active tense, right? So this is a command that here's, here's, our, here's our role. Here's our response. This is what you do. So we walk in him. That's active. That's you and I. He's doing all this work in us. He's, he's rooted us, and he's building us up, and he's establishing us in the faith. And in response to that, we abound in thanksgiving. It means overflowing with thankfulness. Present, active, continuous, repeated action. This is to be the, the characteristic of God's people. When people see a Christian on their journey, they should see thankfulness. That's usually how you hear people describe Christians, isn't it? Not so much, right? Christians are often described as what? Angry? Bitter? (laughs) Grumbling? Complaining? Hypocritical, but not thankful? We were talking about this in our elder meeting yesterday morning, and uh, Troy, Troy, you know, our youth pastor, Troy, he used to work in a restaurant setting. He said it was the worst day. Sunday was the worst day to work. He, Christians are terrible tippers. Terrible tippers. Right? They, they do not show gratitude. In fact, we're the ones who typically grumble, complain, and pick and nitpick, right? Shame on us. If anyone should show grace, if anyone should show mercy, it should be us. Out of what we have, we, we didn't deserve anything, and we got everything. Our lives should be characterized by thankfulness. We sang that beautiful hymn this morning, My heart is filled with thankfulness. For who he is, for what he's done for us. Are you a grumbler? Are you a complainer? Get your eyes on Christ. Remember. Remember the cross. Remember his grace. And give thanks. Give thanks. Abound in thanksgiving. And there's much for us to take away from this this morning. And, and more we could dig into. But the reality is this. If you have not received Christ Jesus the Lord. You are not rooted in Him. You are not being built up on Him. You have not been established in the faith. In fact, you are separated from this God who made you. And unless you turn from your sin and you receive Jesus Christ, you will certainly, surely perish. You will be separated from Him. Not rooted in Him, but separated from Him for all eternity in a place called hell. If you do not know Him, Dear friend, today is the day of salvation. Call on him. Cry out to him. Have mercy on me, a sinner. I know most of you have done that. But let me ask you this. If you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, are you walking in him? Is this the continual journey? That, or are you distracted and going in this direction and that direction Do the people around you, would would they recognize that you're a Christian? Would they see evidence of Christ in your life? This is to be our condition, continually walking in him with our eyes fixed firmly on the end. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. We'll get there eventually. Colossians 3, 2. We look to Christ, brothers and sisters. He's doing this work in us. And so we have hope that regardless of how far we fall or how many times we're distracted, in the end, he's going to complete this work in you. Let us give thanks this morning.